Tonight on Newswire LA, we take you to the Museum of Traffic Control. All of that and more coming up after the credits. And welcome to Newswire LA. I'm your host, Chin Thomas Angsi. Recently, we were digging through the vaults of Westlake Signal Group and found a really fun film that we produced several years ago. The film took a look at something called the Museum of Traffic Control. The Museum of Traffic Control was originally based in Fullerton, California, and was tended to by a gentleman by the name of John Redfeld. John was known to his fans as Signal Fan. And John had an interesting array of traffic lights, signs, and signals. The museum became a mecca for those in the traffic control field. Well, we went out to the museum just before it was dismantled and moved to Iowa. We had a chance to spend a full day with John and his collection. And we put together a film that was later known as Life in the Fast Lane. And we've decided to break it up in its original configuration. The original configuration showed images from the Museum of Traffic Control and interviews with Signal Fan, but we also made it a history of motoring in Los Angeles and the U.S. So what we'd like to do with you over the next couple of weeks is break out this film, and we know you'll have a good time because it's very L.A.-centric, but it gives you education at the same time. So tonight, let's begin our look at the Museum of Traffic Control mixed in with a little bit of motoring history. We'll see you back here shortly. Detroit holds the crown as the Motor City, but Southern California holds the championship for the longest ongoing love affair with the automobile. This affair has created a baby boom of cars and trucks that have turned the California dream into a nightmare at 20 miles per hour. The network of streets and highways that link hundreds of square miles of landscape were never designed to handle the volume it's now sustaining. If Southern California traffic stops moving, the effects could be chilling in several areas, beginning with the commercial aspect. the artistic aspect, and in the sciences and technology. Attempting to control the flow of traffic is a network of signals that tell us when to go, use caution, and stop. Directional signs keep us from going north when we want to go south. Finally, there are hidden devices that seem to come straight out of science fiction that control it all. We're going on a journey that will give us a closer look at the nature of the devices that keep us moving. Our guide will be a man who's built a museum and opened the doors to a unique hobby shared by many. There will be periodic stops and closer looks at historic and non-historic sites that were born out of the traffic system. So sit back as we pull out of the driveway and onto a road where passing on the right is permitted so we can enter the on-ramp of life in the fast lane. Early controllers of traffic in Los Angeles and many other cities were these simple devices, flashing beacons, also known as a cyclops. Tell us a little bit about this beacon that's closest to us. The closest one here to us is a Krauss Heinz Type M beacon. Mm -hmm. It followed the uh, Type D and DT. Uh, it was manufactured around 1952. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, was in operation and, and uh, they kept manufacturing them through the 60s, early 60s. Now these beacons, they were not used very much here in the West. 
No. There are some spots where they probably used them, but these were mostly popular where in the wet in the Midwest mm -hmm. and the East. Midwest and East, yes. It's all four in one contained box unit. Uh, a lot of the towns that couldn't afford a red, yellow, green signal or didn't have a, the traffic to warrant it would get one of these in their main town to stop traffic or slow it down. All right, give me a little idea of this particular beacon we're looking at. This beacon is an early beacon made by Eagle. It's called an Eagle Lux, was their early line of signals. Um, it is date stamped 1936 on the reflectors. So we know its age. It has the embossed uh, caution lenses. And that yes. is that is Econolite's first signal. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, when Econolite Corporation uh, was started, that what they manufactured was a stop sign with a flashing red beacon in it. And the red beacon flashing motion is used by a little magnetic disc inside that would move a armature and a cam contact to make the lamp flash. That was their patent, their design, so that, that's kind of what they came out with as their um, version of the first traffic signal. The man you've been listening to is John Rittfeld, known from here on as Signal Fan. He owns an amazing variety of vintage and modern signals, signs, and items that can only be termed roadside oddities. All have been displayed at his Museum of Traffic Control. The other voice you hear belongs to filmmaker Chin Tamasengsi. So uh, the railroads basically were the inspiration for the traffic signal because uh, the railroads had a traffic problem before the highways did, uh, being that at that time there were only horse and buggies and there were fewer people, but the trains uh, created a, a safety concern of running into each other and things like that. So signaling was first developed for the railroads and um, with the green and the red lights and all that. It started out in England uh, because they had the first railroads in England. Um, but then it got adapted to highway use. Um, basically, a lot of the railroad engineers came up with ideas on um, regulating traffic on the roads. So the ideas of the semaphore, and which created, which went on to the, the colored light and all that, basically stemmed from the railroads. The biggest innovations in signal technology came from inventors who took on the task of improving traffic technology. There are actually many, many inventors of the traffic signal, um, all different kinds and different styles. Um, there is no one true inventor. Um, 1868, uh, there was um, a gentleman that name escapes me right now that created the first uh, light outside of Parliament uh, for the traffic um, that was beginning to grow with the hor horses and buggies and all that. Um, but later, in the early part of the century, there was a couple of inventors. Uh, there's um, Garrett Morgan that has been heard of as being the inventor. Originally, his, his traffic signal design was of a semaphore style signal, uh, and he was the first one to get a patent for a traffic signal device. However, his device is not one that we use today. It's worth noting that Morgan was one of the most successful and revered African American inventors in the U.S. There also is a couple of other inventors, James Hodge and a couple of others that, through time. Um, and then William Potts, basically, as the creator of the signal that's most like that we know today. It was the original four-way uh, red, yellow, and green, all-in-one box type signal. So he uh, secured the patent on that, that device. But that's the closest device that we know of today uh, that traces back to 1920 when he uh, originally created that signal. Pot's four-way signal became the template for all four-way designs to follow. Signal Fan shows us some later incarnations of that design. The uh, early traffic signals uh, employed command lenses as well as the colors to kind of introduce to the public what the indications meant. Uh, red indeed meant stop, yellow caution, green go, as well as uh, you know colorblind people to be able to read the messages and uh, learn the positions of each light. They, didn't, they offered it as an option in the early 50s, but then discontinued it soon after. So most signals by the, in the 50s didn't use messages. In the Midwest and the East even used four-way lights because they were um, earlier in the timeline of needing signals. Um, by the time the West Coast started really using, I guess they started using a different type of signal, which was the Semaphore Acme and the Wiley, um, they went from there to just um, being able to use single-phase signals. They never got into using four ways. I'm not sure what the exact reason is why, but um, when they did use a four-way type signal, they were four single mounted signals in a, a cluster. So it just was, I guess, west practice versus east practice. Four ways were not known to be used in the city of Los Angeles, but were used in outlying areas of LA County. 
This signal qualifies as a roadside oddity courtesy of our friends in San Francisco. The portion of the signal you see weighs over 200 pounds. Let me push this guy out a little bit and I can actually show you how it works. Okay. Uh, basically access to this light, pop the acorn off the top, which is a heavy guy. It's a cast iron uh, acorn and pop out the screw that holds the top part together and then basically this whole part lifts off and you have basically just a cylinder that rotates 90 degrees and over here you can kind of see the mechanical parts it's a huge electromagnet that draws up the drawbar and clicks it into the other position there's also a bell at the bottom that is I'm working on trying to get uh, working a little bit better it rings a little bit but it needs a little harder knock to make it really ring but that's what these little knockers at the bottom are for that'll steal a finger yeah yeah. And I didn't realize until we until you had opened it opened up that this sign actually actually had lights behind it. Yeah. So it could be seen at night. Yep. It had the uh, stop and go, I think I call it flashing with the plex not plexi, I think this was glass actually, a frosted glass piece behind it. Today world it would be plexi. But. Now the two lights at the bottom. Uh huh. Those are just simple stop and go stop and go commands, huh? Yes. No yeah. yellow indicator, no ye obviously. No yellow indicator. Uh, these used lenses that were similar to the railroad lenses in that they were Fresnel style with the concentric circles. Um, the newer lenses use more of a refractive pattern on them. More than likely, the Wiley signal head would have been a great fit with the fixture design along Wilshire Boulevard in the Miracle Mile. However, the city went with the more compact Acme semaphore. 1895 was the year a man named Henry purchased 35 acres of land southwest of today's downtown LA. He believed the ranchos would give way to sprawling commercial centers. Henry was contacted by the city fathers who sought to build a road that would ultimately bisect his property. He agreed with two conditions. First, the street would have to be 120 feet wide for the rush of traffic he forecasted would use the boulevard. Second, the street would have to bear his name, Henry Gaylord Wilshire. By the late 1920s, Wilshire Boulevard was a mecca for art, fashion, and commerce. By the year 2000, the boulevard ran from the heart of downtown to the shores of the Pacific in what is LA's ultimate love note to the car culture. Signal Fan's Museum of Traffic Control was based in this unassuming Fullerton, California residence. It was also the place he called home. So how many signal signs and controllers are in the Museum of Traffic Control? I have presently 92 signals. I have 53 traffic controllers, including controllers and cabinets, and I have over 600 signs at present. Builders between the 30s and 50s felt their structures should have a sense of style like no other, and so did the designers of the infrastructure. This is the Krauss Heinz. Um, the collectors call them Art Deco, even though they really weren't referred to as such because of these um, ornamental fins on the tops and the bottoms. This is actually the type DT, which st stands for dust tight. Uh, it was the second version of these in which the reflector um, met the gasket and created a, a dust tight seal. The older D version didn't have that, so dust could get into the reflector and, and make it dirty. But this was their revolutionary uh, style signal at the time in the 1950s. Now, is the Krauss Heinz, are they still building Krauss Heinz? Krauss Heinz is no longer in business. They sold their uh, business to TCT. Uh, I think they still have a lot of the original molds but some of the ones for these signals have long gone, so these signals are fairly rare. Okay, okay. and this one, and again, these were more common in the Midwest and probably the East than they ever were here. Even, yes. though, even though you did mention that, yeah. a couple of spots here, Whittier has some of them. Santa Barbara used to have a bunch of them, but I think it was all depending on the city and um, yeah. you know what particular intersection we're talking about. As signals controlled more traffic, Technology was developed to control them. The first actuated signal designs proved interesting and potentially hazardous to one's sanity. 
the uh, first actuated signals were actually horn actuated, which meant the driver pulled up to the intersection and honked their horn, and that would uh, be like a micro. There was a, a box with a microphone, and that would activate the relay to change the signal. Um, I don't think it gained very much widespread popularity, obviously because of the noise problem. But uh, it is interesting to know that the first actuated signals were horn or sound actuated. Um, but I don't know <laughs> who the person was thinking, you know, what they were thinking when they created those. But uh, it, it, as far as I know, it didn't gain any widespread use. Despite its appearance, we're proud to say that this signal is not horn actuated. We're sure this eases the minds of many weary Angelinos viewing this film. Signal Fan demonstrates a more familiar form of actuated traffic control. The clicking sound you hear behind me here is from an electromechanical controller. This is the Econolite Type F controller. Uh, these were used all over Southern California. They were the most common controller used. Um, the clicking is the uh, cam advancing the, uh, or the drum advancing the cam one position, which would change the lights. So each click you hear is a light changing. Um, these were used from the 50s all the way through the 70s, even into the early 80s, actually. This one? Does this, this controls control? the cross signs with the command lenses. Okay. Uh, it's basically here. Uh, there is a this up. This has the dial in it. My thumb screw going here. And you can see the, the rotating dial. And each time it hits the contact, it advances the cam one position. So it's about to do right there. And this one, you undo the back piece. Which you can do here. see the spinning disc use a different form of technology where the disc rotates and spins it also has, incorporates its flasher with the spinning action as the dial hits the contact it'll move this cam row one position and uh, the contacts for the signal lamps are right lined up along there now, is this a technology that was fraught with a lot of breakdowns and everything like that? Yeah, mostly in the wintertime when things get cold and sticky and all that. That's uh, a lot of times signals would get stuck in, in a position, and so the guy would have to come out and unstick them. People would be sitting at a red light overly long or a yellow light that just sits there in yellow. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, ultimately why electronics took over because they were more reliable in, in the harsh environments. To and easy to maintain, yeah. So, like on this, on this Eagle electromechanical, they uh, employed a, a light bulb down here at the bottom that was normally lit all winter long and kept the cabinet warm so it wouldn't freeze up. Because a lot of the electromechanical controllers, using moving parts, could freeze up in the winter if they weren't kept to a, a certain temperature. So, a lot of times they, uh, I have a smaller wattage bulb in there now, but they'd use just a standard traffic signal bulb in there, and it would keep the cabinet warm and uh, keep the parts from freezing. Okay. This was a pole-mounted 